Welcome, I'm Barbara Batson, Exhibitions Coordinator at the Library of Virginia, and I'm here with my colleague and co-curator, Mary Julian. And we're in the gallery of our current exhibition, We Demand Women's Suffrage in Virginia. So what we're gonna do today is give you an overview of the gallery and hope that you'll come visit. The show is open um, through Friday, May 28th of 2021. So Mary, tell us a little bit about the founding of suffrage in Virginia. Alrighty, well, the, there were two groups started in Virginia, one in the 1870s and one in the 1890s, but neither one of them really got very much support from women in Virginia. And so they were pretty short-lived. And it wasn't until 1909 that a group of about two dozen Richmond women who were actively involved in various uh, progressive era reform movements um, related to public education and public health and labor laws related to women and children. And so these women who were trying to convince legislator legislators to pass um, laws benefiting public education and health and along these lines realized that they would have more persuasive power if they could vote themselves. And so, and some of these women also said that we are citizens and we're being denied our basic voting rights. And they got together in 1909 um, and organized the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia. And this was an affiliate of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And they were working for amendments to state constitutions. And in Virginia, the Equal Suffrage League was working to persuade the General Assembly to secure the suffrage for women on equal terms with men. Even though they were not successful with this in 1912, 1914, and 1916, the Assembly voted against it. Um, these women were more successful than they've really been given credit for. They wound up having something like 140 chapters and um, forgotten how many thousands of members? More than 20,000. More than 20,000. So that made the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia the largest non-military organization in the Commonwealth. That's something to think about. These were women who were upper middle class or middle class and they had leisure. So how did they get the word out to their friends? Through tea parties, card parties, they went out and marched, they cornered uh, legislators in their offices and in their homes, and they traveled at almost at the drop of a hat. We have broadsides in the exhibition that talked a little bit about how the women thinking of Elizabeth Lewis particularly, who uh, and Lila B. Valentine, who would just travel anywhere around the Commonwealth to talk about the importance of the vote. Uh, so it's all about persuasion, not by marching and not by protesting, but by persuasion. They were convinced that this is how they were going to win the vote. But there were things like, um, there were plays and there was a movie, a silent film, uh, at one point that um, was also here in Richmond. I've never seen the film. I'm not sure that any prints exist, but it would be great fun to find them. There were song books, and so they would sing songs about suffrage too, and postcards all to do with suffrage. And these were mass produced by the National American Woman so Suffrage Association. And the local chapters, the local, the state organizations could buy these in, on bulk and then send them out. This is the period where you don't have the internet and you don't have uh, social media, um, not everyone had a telephone. So they really relied on newspapers to get the word out and also relied on flyers, on uh, little leaflets that could be mass produced. And the mail was incredibly important. But they did actually march. There were often local parades uh, the communities would have for a Labor Day or Memorial Day or you know, different kinds of local occasions and the women would decorate a car with uh, placards and they would wear their votes for women's sashes and they would march in, uh, in local parades. Um, they would also hold rallies. Uh, 
National Suffrage Day was held in May in 1914 and 1915, and women in Richmond organized rally as at Capitol Square, and there were also rallies in other towns, Lynchburg, Williamsburg, um, Norfolk, and so these were ways that they wanted to get the word out and to persuade, as Barbara said, um, women and men to support women's suffrage because at the turn of the 20th century, there was definitely not a lot of support for women's suffrage in Virginia. Far more women and men opposed it. And so there were people who organized um, to counter the work of the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia. Uh, yes, the Virginians Associate, it was, it was the Virginia Virginians Associated. Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, V-A-O-W-S. Um, these were women and a lot of men. As a matter of fact, their board of directors were all men, which I find rather interesting. Um, but they argued that women should not be involved in politics, that politics is a dirty business, and women have more influence from the home as the nurturers of children and family. They can, they can talk to their husbands and their brothers and their sons to convince them to get through some of this legislation for the betterment of society. So, you know, they also had um, their chapters, they had their leaflets, but there was one aspect of suffrage that the antis really played up. They pointed out correctly that if the legislator gave or recognized women's right to vote, it wasn't just white women that would also extend the suffrage to black women. And Virginia had just spent 20 years disfranchising African-American men. And the 1902 Constitution disfranchised as much as 90 or 95 percent of eligible African-American men voters. And also as much as 50 percent of the poor white voters, all to consolidate power among an elite. So the antis really played up the race card. The Equal Suffrage League and the national organizations countered that argument by saying, don't worry about it. There are more white voters than there are black voters, and we can take care of that. And then as we'll talk a little bit later in the gallery, the registration process in Virginia also worked to limit the number of African Americans and poor whites who could actually register to vote. Yes, so the Equal Suffrage League was a organization for white women only. They were not interested in having African American women um, as members. And, um, and as Barbara mentioned, they pushed back against the argument of the anti-suffragist. They published their own pamphlet and won Equal Suffrage in the Negro Vote. You know, they said that the poll taxes and literacy tests that Virginia had enacted to de disfranchise African-American men would work just as well against African-American women, and that therefore uh, woman suffrage would not menace white supremacy in Virginia. But even though African-American women were not allowed to participate in the um, in the Equal Suffrage League, we know that many African-American women in Virginia supported women's suffrage. Um, Maggie Walker, the Richmond civil rights activist and uh, bank president, and the head of the uh, Order of St. Luke, which was a fraternal benefit association, she often spoke about the importance of the vote and the St. Luke Herald, which was the newspaper of, um, of her organization, regularly kept the issue of voting rights and women's voting rights before her readers. And she, um, she would give speeches around the country and she would often talk about voting rights. And in 1912, when the National Association of Colored Women held its convention at Hampton Institute, she spoke about how women's work was devalued. And she commented that capital at once took advantage of woman's necessity by compelling her to do a man's work at a lower wage. Of course, the women rebelled and are rebelling and rebellious even still, but capital will, is deaf and will never hear their cries until women force capital 
to hear them at the ballot box. So she knew exactly how important it was to have the vote. Um, many of these women had experienced the changes in Virginia after the Civil War and after the 15th Amendment had been enacted, giving African-American men the right to vote. And so they had seen you know, what had happened. There were African-American men who served in the General Assembly or sat on city councils or were elected to boards of supervisors. So they knew how important having the ballot was to you know, bringing about civil rights and affecting the change that they wanted to see. Um, there were many other women, Josephine Norcom, who was a um, teacher and community activist in Portsmouth. She spoke about civil rights to women's clubs. There were a number of Virginia delegates to the convention that Maggie Walker spoke at of the National Association of Colored Women, and they undoubtedly supported the convention's resolution that it was passed in favor of women's suffrage. Um, and women like Janie Porter Barrett, who was president of the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, who attended that convention. She was the head of a school, and in later years after the amendment, the 19th Amendment was ratified, she would regularly tell the, uh, the girls who attended her school how important it was for them to vote and take their, take their duty seriously. So even though we don't have a lot of records about African-American women and their work in Virginia, we do know that they were definitely supporting women's suffrage and speaking out about it in their own communities. But there's another group that organizes in Virginia. So we're gonna walk a little ways down the gallery and take a look at this second organization. So, by 1915, there was another group of Virginia women who had been founding members of their local chapters of the Equal Suffrage League, but they had become convinced that working for a state constitution was going to take way too long. Well, the ESL had been founded in 1909, here it was 1915, and not a whole lot of movement. So these women joined the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage and created the Virginia branch. We didn't know a whole lot about them until the great-granddaughter of Sophie Meredith, who's standing behind me over here, gave us the minute book for the Congressional Union Virginia branch. Oh my goodness, it was a wonderful document to have. So now we know so much more about these women and what an incredible bunch of women they are. These are the people, these are the women who in 1917 started picketing the White House becoming the first group to do this in an organized fashion. And what happened? They got arrested. One of the people who was arrested was Pauline Adams from Norfolk. She had been a founding member of the Equal Suffrage League chapter in Norfolk, and she was evidently quite a spitfire. She was not only arrested, but she served time in the workhouse at Occupy. It was not a pleasant experience, to say the least. Some of the women went on hunger strikes and they were force fed. Their clothing was dirty. It was just not a pleasant experience. And Pauline actually wrote her, uh, her husband and her sons um, on letterhead from the workhouse and also from on toilet paper. She just needed some writing material. And she complains that she has been denied her hairbrush, her comb, her toothbrush, and even paper with which to write them. 
So she had borrowed a pencil from a new inmate and had scrounged some of the paper, and that's how she wrote them. And we have those in our collection. The other interesting thing about the Congressional Union, which later became the National Women's Party, which still exists, is that in 1919, Pauline was one of the women who went on a national tour to talk about their experiences in the workhouse. And all of that was to drum up support for the, what became the 19th Amendment, which is then winning its way through Congress and then being sent out to the state legislatures. There's actually film footage of these women um, getting off the train in San Francisco, and they would dress in reproductions of their prison clothes. And they would enact how they or reenact how they had to behave in prison. For example, they could walk only by putting their hand on the shoulder of the person in front of them. They couldn't speak to one another, they couldn't speak to anyone else, they had to keep silence. But they talked about their experiences everywhere, and obviously it was successful. And I mean, they went everywhere. Jacksonville, Florida, San Antonio, Texas, San Francisco, California, Denver, Colorado, wound up going up to Boston and coming back to Washington, D.C. But they were the active group. So when you hear, when you read about women's suffrage, that tends to be the group that gets a lot of, um, a lot of the attention. Um, and rightfully so, because they were really risking life and limb. Um, in protesting. They're all trying to get uh, President Wilson to support women's suffrage, and they were doing it by embarrassing him, by putting out banners that said, Mr. President, we're fighting for uh, democracy overseas. Why not democracy at home? Because remember, 1917, the United States enters the war in Europe in World War I, and Wilson makes a big deal about democracy abroad and democracy at home. Now, the Equal Suffrage League and the National Association for Women's Suffrage took a step back and said during World War I, we're going to show that we're good patriots, so we're going to scale back some of our activities. Because they thought that if they demonstrated that they were good patriots, that when the war ended, they could use that as leverage to win uh, women's suffrage. The Congressional Union National Women's Party said, no, we're just not going to do that. And if anything, they stepped up their activities. So Mary, there's one woman in particular um, that we didn't know a whole lot about, and she has a record? We did not know very much about um, many of the women who were members of the Virginia branch of the Congressional Union. One that we learned more about was Maude Jameson. She was a teacher in Norfolk. Um, and she actually, she had first been involved with the Equal Suffrage League, like Pauline, and she quickly joined the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. She quit her teaching job. She went to work in the national headquarters in Washington, D.C. for the Congressional Union, which in 1917 became the National Women's Party. And um, she took her portable typewriter with her to the office and worked there. But not only did she work in the office, she spent a lot of time on the picket lines at the White House, and she was arrested multiple times, um, at least six or seven that we know of for sure, and possibly as many times um, as a dozen or so. And she was also at the Occoquan Workhouse, and um, I think at least one of her terms she might have been in the uh, in one of the prisons in D.C. where they jailed some of the suffragists. But she, she was, she was on fire for women's suffrage. That's for sure. <laughs> and it is important. Um, these in Virginia, this was definitely a smaller group than the Equal Suffrage League. They had at the most between five and six hundred members, unlike the Equal Suffrage League, which had more than twenty thousand. But they were definitely more forceful with. Um, with their picketing and participating, um, you know, in in more more dramatic activities to keep suffrage at the forefront of people's minds, which is what the National Women's Party founder Alice Paul was trying to do. She wanted to keep women's suffrage on the front pages, and um, 
And yes, the Eagle Suffrage League did not like this. Uh, Lila Lee Valentine, president of the League, condemned the uh, folly of these fanatical women who were picketing the White House, especially during wartime. So there, there was um, conflict between the two groups and how to best proceed to achieve their goal. In June 1919, the U.S. Congress sent the 19th Amendment to the state legislatures. Now, the Equal Suffrage League, the national organization, um, and also the National Women's Party, had been um, at loggerheads about how to proceed and how to get um, people to support the 19th Amendment during World War I. Well, 1919, the war was over, and at this point, both organizations supported the federal amendment. The Equal Suffrage League and the national organization, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, had come around to thinking about that the federal amendment was in fact the better way to go. Still not happy about the former protests, but anything to achieve suffrage. And they came up with a rather clever idea of how to track where the legislators stood on this. So behind me you see some cards and also some of these individual cards. Take a close look at these. They have photographs and they have notes about where the men, because these were all men, where they stood on the question of suffrage. Some of these, they went back to 1912 to see where some of these men had stood and how they had changed or not changed their opinion. If they were uh, turnable, was the word that they used, uh, that meant that they could be persuaded and there are a number of men who said, I do support woman suffrage, but you know, my wife doesn't, so I have to pay attention to her. Or my daughter is all for suffrage, but I just don't think women have a place in politics. So some of the comments in these cards, you, today you read them and you just have to roll your eyes um, at some of the comments. And I'm, but the Equal Suffrage League women went into these legislators' offices and they talked and they talked and they talked to them anything to convince them to support the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So when the, when the amendment came up at the General Assembly uh, for the ratification debate, um, not surprisingly, the General Assembly said, nope, not gonna ratify it. But they did something unexpected. And what was that, Mary? Yes, well, they did two things. One was they passed an act that the um, suffragists called the Machinery Bill because it authorized um, that if the 19th Amendment was ratified before the election, the general election in 1920, that women in Virginia could register to vote even if the deadline to pay their poll tax and register had already passed. So this meant that women could register in 1920 instead of having to wait until 1921, which would have been the case otherwise. But the assembly also did something that was surprising in that a lot of the men had come around to the suffragist point of view that they did deserve the right to vote. As Barbara mentioned, they did not approve the 19th Amendment because, again, they, the white Virginia politicians were more interested in controlling the electorate. And after they had you know, disfranchised African-American men who had been given the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, they were afraid that they would have to you know, start all over with their disfranchisement efforts if the 19th Amendment was passed. But, they authorized um, woman suffrage, amending the state constitution to allow for woman suffrage. Now, of course, this first step, the legislature would have had to pass the same um, language again in the session of 1922, and then sent that to the voters for ratification in the fall of 1922. So all of that was rendered unnecessary by the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. 
But there were, the suffragists had persuaded enough men in the General Assembly that women's suffrage was coming and they had better get on board, especially once women could start to vote. There were plenty of politicians in Virginia who didn't want to be seen as being on the wrong side of the question of women's voting rights. So it was not a failure. So it was not quite the failure that people often uh, seem to think that it was. But, and then once the 19th Amendment was ratified in August 1920, Virginia women started registering almost immediately. Um, official registration opened on September 2nd, but there were women coming in to register even before that. And voter registration was not the same process that it is today. Um, women had to pay their poll tax first at the treasurer's office because they were new voters, they only had to pay for one year, which was $1.50. Normally, you had to be paid up for three years at a time. And that may not sound like a lot of money now, but a lot of people, most people, earn less than $100 a month, and $1.50 is you know, not insignificant to them. So yes, the prospective voter, after she paid her poll tax, had to take her receipt from the treasurer to the registrar's office and fill out the necessary information, uh, her name, her residence, her age, how long she had lived in Virginia and in the precinct, and women had to do this without any prompting. Although white women would sometimes get a sheet of paper from the registrar that listed all the required information, um, and African-American women women would not, so they would have to keep all of that information in their head and know to provide it. Um, and if you didn't know the right information, the registrar could reject your application and then you would be out of your $1.50 poll tax because that was not refunded to you. So at the registrar's office, they also had the power to ask any question to determine your eligibility to vote which they would do to, um, in particular to African-American women, they would ask questions like, how many people does it take to make a county? Or um, how long can the House of Representatives recess without the consent of the Senate? And so if you didn't know the answer to any of the questions you were asked, then again, you could be rejected and you would be out of your poll tax. But despite all of this, um, between 75,000 and 100,000 women registered to vote. African-American women and white women both held um, massive voter registration efforts. In Richmond, Maggie Walker and social worker Ora Brown Stokes helped more than 2,000 African-American women register to vote. They, um, they also asked to be deputized as assistant registrars, which a couple of equal suffrage league members had been to help white women register to vote, but uh, Maggie Walker and Laura Stokes were turned down in their request. But um, on election day in November 1920, approximately 77,000 women turned out to vote, and oftentimes the newspapers would comment on how they had taken to voting just like a duck takes to water, much to their surprise. Um, you know, notwithstanding that the Equal Suffrage League had been holding citizenship schools for months um, to prepare women for voting, and as we mentioned, all these other groups of white and black women had been preparing women to, to get out and vote. So even though it was a not a large percentage of the electorate, fewer than 15% um, of eligible women uh, registered to vote. It was still pretty successful in a state that actively discouraged people from registering and voting. But the 19th Amendment didn't solve all the problems, so we have one more little area to look at. The 19th Amendment didn't solve everything. Yes, it was the largest uh, in, um, in increase in the number of eligible voters in the United States in American history, but there were a number of people who still faced problems. African Americans faced poll taxes and literacy tests. And Native Americans, you may not know, could not vote until 1924 because they were not recognized as citizens of this country until that year. 
So there was a lot that still had to be done. The Civil Rights Act of 1965, Voting Rights Act of also 1965, did a lot to remove some of the barriers. There was an amendment um, in the U.S. Constitution that basically eradicated um, or declared unconstitutional any poll tax for any, um, any election, federal, state, local. And so that really did a lot to remove a lot of the barriers. But still there were barriers. Today we look at things like um, consolidation of polling places and transportation to and from polling places and also for people who work multiple jobs trying to get to their polling place in order to cast their ballot. So there's still a lot to be done. But in 1920, the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia kind of ceased to uh, exist in a way, didn't it, Mary? They did. They folded up shop after the 19th Amendment was ratified in August 1920. And in November 1920, they officially organized the League of Women Voters, which was a nonpartisan um, voter education organization. And like the National League of Women Voters, the Virginia League of Women Voters um, did the same thing. They held citizenship schools to prepare women for voting. And they also lobbied for legislation that was important to them related to public schools and health care and high food prices. And in 1921, at the uh, Virginia League of Women Voters urging the governor established a Children's Code Commission that included a couple of uh, former suffrage activists as members. And that commission suggested about two dozen or so pieces of legislation that were passed at the 1922 General Assembly session, most of the uh, suggestions. And not only did the women form the League of Women Voters, but there were some women who jumped right into the political arena, even though the anti-suffragists had warned that the political woman would be a menace. Uh, that did not deter some of the women. Janet Durham, who had been one of the first women to register in Richmond in 1920, just a few months later, she uh, decided to run for a seat in the House of Delegates in the city of Richmond. And she was not the only one. There were about a dozen women who ran for seats in the House of Delegates. Uh, two women ran for the um, superintendent of public instruction. And one woman even ran for governor as an independent socialist. So even though none of them won in 1921, they were paving a way for future women to sit in the General Assembly. A total of six held office, um, or one election to the General Assembly during the 1920s. And then there was kind of a long drought. <laughs> and uh, it's taken Virginia a while. It's, there have been ups and downs with women in office. But in 2020, we had the first female speaker of the House of Delegates and the first uh, African-American woman who was the president pro tem of the state Senate. And in 2021, we have a number of women running for governor. So perhaps 100 years after the first woman did so, we might see a woman win election to the executive mansion in Virginia. But that was not all. The women of the National Women's Party also kept busy. They did. I bet you don't know that the Equal Rights Amendment was first introduced into Congress in 1923. And we know that the members of the what had been the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage Virginia branch, later part of the National Women's Party, they were very active in, um, in trying to promote the passage to the ratification of the ERA. Well, it was a long time before it even got through Congress. As some of us remember, it was not until the 1970s and the 80s when the push really began. And there were Virginia women who were at the forefront um, arguing and advocating for the Equal Rights Amendment. And son of a gun. On January 27th, 2020, the Virginia General Assembly ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, making it as the 38th state to ratify the amendment. That does make it official. Well, kind of. The archivist of the United States still needs to certify it. There are some legal challenges. But we have here some materials from uh, some of the ladies who were very active in the ERA movements here in Virginia. And it's not to say that this, um, the suffragist, 
who were still alive were all in favor of the ERA. Adele Clark, who had been um, a passionate suffragist, was dead set against passage of the ERA. She felt that it would remove any protection for any remo remaining protections for women. Um, I'm not quite sure what she would say today if she were alive, but um, she was definitely dead set against it. So there's still unfinished business. There's still some things that need to be done. But whenever we vote, we stand on the shoulders of the women who came before us. And we have to thank them both for and against for their advocacy or not, because they all show did go out and vote. And it's really important, as Mary likes to say, it is our superpower as citizens of this country. For more information, and big tip of the hat to my colleague Mary Julian for this, we have a really wonderful website related to this exhibition. Go there for more biographies, an interactive map that shows you where all the ESL chapters around the Commonwealth were. There's just a wealth of information, so do please check it out.